The book of Proverbs is a gold mine. It's a treasure chest. It's like, uh, it's like going to uh, a mall where everything is, is, uh, that you want is there and it's free. It's offered to you. It's just unbelievable to go to the book of Proverbs and to see. But we're looking each day at one of the treasures that are in Proverbs. And today, we're talking about marriage. Now, I call marriage the second greatest day of your life. I say that when I perform ceremonies. I have stood with 300 couples, and one at a time, and married them, performed the ceremony. And I always say, to all their friends and family that have come to the wedding, I say, welcome to the second greatest day of this couple's life. And you see people out there and they're going, the people listening go, and they whisper, they go, is this their second marriage? Some of them think I'm saying that they've been married before. You know, it's their second marriage. But what am I saying? What would be the greatest day of your life? When you got saved. Right? Right? Wouldn't you say that? Wouldn't you all say the greatest day of your life was when Jesus forgave you and you got eternal life? Yes or no? Yes. yes. So marriage next to that is the second greatest day. Do you know why? Now, a lot of people aren't happily married. Did you know that? Have you ever seen anybody unhappy in their marriage? Have you ever seen someone, you know, their marriage is falling apart? So a lot of people don't think of marriage as the second greatest day. But what God designed marriage to be is for every husband. So, you know, I should, I should do this. Let's see. Uh, who, who, I should do a, a perform a little marriage ceremony up here. It would scare some of you if I picked any of you. Who is the, the least fearful person here? I need a a bride and a groom, who can I use? Okay, uh, Naomi, you'll be our bride. Who, who would be the best fella that's just least shy? Okay, Cody, you're a doctor, come on. Uh, come on over here, come on over here and stand. And you face each other. And this is what I say at a wedding. Now don't hold hands or anything. This, I'm not officiating an official marriage. But I look and I say, welcome to the second greatest day in this dear couple's life. <laughs> now as the pastor, do you know what I see up close? The fella has sweat is coming out all over him. And a lot of them are like this. Their, their knees are moving and they're scared. The young lady is so afraid she's gonna have tears and ruin her makeup, and she's got this little hidden, usually they have a little hidden tissue or something here, and during the prayers they're going, you know, they, and they're hoping it's not filmed. And so all that's going on, and I'm standing up here enjoying it, and this is what I say. Cody has chosen for the rest of his life to show everybody in the world how much Jesus Christ loves his church. And the people sitting out there are going, this is just a wedding ceremony. What, are, what is this? Most people don't realize that God designed marriage for a man to take the role of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are dating someone, men, Every one of you men, if you ask a girl out, what you're saying to her is, could I be like Jesus Christ? Could I live like him, loving you like he loves you? Do any girls think of that? About one in a hundred. They look for how much muscle he has, his hair, you know, whether or not, you know, he dresses nicely, his car. <laughs> how much money he has. No, I, right, right. <laughs> and then I say, this bride has chosen 
to be like a mirror reflecting Christ's love. And so she wants to be just like the church. And you know how when you get saved, how much you love the Lord? Do you all remember when you first understood salvation, that he loved you, that he died for you? That Jesus took your place and, and you love him? That's how much a wife is to love her husband. And, and so we get going in that and all of a sudden the audience, the friends, start realizing it's the second greatest day. So I pronounce you uh, a wonderful nurse. <laughs> And I pronounce you a very enthusiastic soon-to-be bride in the Lord's timing. There you go. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, w I do a lot more fun things at weddings, but I'm not going to talk about it because I want to get through this. Uh, yesterday, we started with looking at Proverbs, and it's the Lord's guide. Um, it's his manual. It's his how-to. It's, it's an illustration of how to be wise. It's kind of like um, going online and watching a YouTube video on how to do something, you know, like people, if they want to fix their car or they want to fix their computer or reformat their hard drive, they watch a quick video. That's what Proverbs is like. It illustrates God's wisdom. Then we saw that God has a will. He has told us what his will is, his plans, his desires for us. and and. The best way to live life is doing what God wants. And then Solomon wasted his life and then pride. But today, we're looking at marriage. Now, do you remember, in ranking, these are the main themes of Proverbs. We've been walking through them every day. God wants me wise, not foolish. The whole book is about wisdom. Number two, God wants me teachable. He wants me to come to him and say, I want to know your plan, show me, and not be stubborn and say, I'm, I know what's best. Thirdly, God wants me to be righteous. Uh, if you remember, righteousness, dikaios in, in Greek, is when something lines up. It, it, it totally fits. Um, Mr. Stubbs, uh, who is uh, with us this week with his wife, he works in the oil industry, and he told me this morning that yesterday, his company, uh, they have an oil well. I mean, his company does, he doesn't, but they were drilling, and they sent their, their uh, probe down 14,000 feet, which is just under 5,000 meters down into the ground. And when it got right here, <laughs> their wells go this way. You know, it's called fracking. They go horizontal. When it got to right there, the, the drill they put in was one half an inch too big, and it couldn't turn. It didn't match up. It wasn't, to use Bible terms, righteous. <laughs> it didn't fit. It didn't, it didn't line up. And what God wants is God wants me to line up with him. For me to say, I want you to make me righteous. I don't want any part of my life to be wicked. Did you know there's some Christians that the way they talk does not please God? The way they treat other people does not please God? Did you know that's true for all of us? Because we're all imperfect. But when we're convicted, that's when the Holy Spirit says, John, you shouldn't think that. John, you shouldn't say that. John, you shouldn't act that way. That's called conviction. When that happens, when God says, you're not fitting, you're not, you're, you're off, you are, and being off, God calls wicked. Most of us don't think of what we do as wicked. We think of what other people do as wicked, but not what I do. I just make mistakes. But compared to God, see, we're supposed to compare ourselves to God, not to others. See, I can always find someone that's worse than me. That's what is easy. I go, well, I'm not as bad as them. Do you remember the two people praying that Jesus talked about, the rich man and the publican? Does anybody remember those two as they're in the temple? The, I mean, not the rich man, the Pharisee and the publican. And so the Pharisee, uh, he compared himself not with God, but with others. And he said, 
I'm not as bad as that guy over there and that guy over there. But the publican, it says in the Bible, he wouldn't even look up toward God. He put his head down and, and it says he went like this and said, God, be merciful to me. I'm wicked like this. You know what Jesus said? The Pharisee had no mercy from God. The publican, who really was wicked but knew it, God justified him. You know what justification means in the Bible? Forgave him of everything. Everything. But the Pharisee, nothing. So God wants me to line up with him. And it starts by me saying, I want you to find any part of me that's wicked. I want you to find any part of me that's proud, and I want it to be humble. So we've already seen those. Here's the, the next lesson. The whole book of Proverbs is about God wants to make me self-controlled, not, and there's that word, rash. What rash means is you just do something right then without thinking about it. You say something without thinking about it. You feel something without letting the Holy Spirit change your, your attitude or your emotions or your thoughts. And so God wants me self-controlled. He wants me to yield to him. Okay, so let's look at what it says in Proverbs. Where do we leave off reading? Who was my last reader yesterday? Remember I said you have to help me. Anybody remember? Okay, and so we're on, uh, we're on, oh, Zephaniah. And so Zephaniah is going to read Proverbs 29.11. And Ellen, in just a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll get you to read 17.27. And then Raul, we're moving back to you. You get 29.8. And Sophia, you get 11. Okay, so Zephaniah, in just a second. Now think about this. This is God's will. How do I know it's God's will? Where is it written down? What are we reading from? What is Zephaniah reading from? The Bible is God's will written down. Did you know that a lot of young people your age very much want to know the Lord's will? They want to know the Lord's will for their job, for their marriage, uh, for their, you know, like... Uh, their schooling, uh, whether they should go to university here or in America or whatever. And they want to know God's will. Did you know that if God's will, 100% of it is, you know, knowing exactly what he wants, 99, at least and a half percent is already written down right here. For every one of you, 99 and a half. Now, if you have 99 and a half percent score in school, don't, aren't you happy? Everybody, there's a little bit that you're, you don't, well, some of you are perfect students, I'm sure. My wife was, by the way. When Bonnie graduated in New York State, she had all these, in America, they give you, if you're smart, you wear this big robe, they give you a big like ribbon thing, like a big medallion on your shoulder, and they give you gold pins, like National Honor Society, National Merit Society, summa cum laude, they have all these terms. When Bonnie graduated, she had this gigantic highest honor and all these buttons, you know, and pins, and she clinked when she walked, it made noise. Me, I didn't even get a robe. <laughs> No, I didn't. They, they came to me and said I couldn't graduate. I, I, was, I had so many, I did so many. Remember I told you in second grade, I got worse in school. I did all kinds of stuff. But, so she's brilliant. And, and I always struggled. In fact, you know my problem, you know what they told me my problem was? I'm dyslexic, which means I see everything backward. I used to write backward. And the teacher always moved my hand. I would, in, in the West, in America, we write, from this side of the paper to this side. I always would start my ABCs like this. Doesn't that look wrong? And the teacher would take my little hand and go, and she'd say, 
that one's backward, that one's backward, that one's backward, that one probably is backward, start over. I used to fall asleep at my desk. I can still remember first grade, just like you guys, because I was so sad, I could never get it right. So I would just go to sleep. And so that's why they barely let me graduate. So there's hope for all of you. None of you are that bad, right? You're writing perfectly. So God says, I want you to be self-controlled. And God says, wise people have a biblical temperament. Do you know what temperament means? It's your emotional attitude. It's the way you are. And people see you in either your calm, quiet, peaceful, or your, you know, all agitated. You can tell that. You see people and you watch them. They go, you know, their temperament is what? They're troubled. God wants us to have a biblical temperament. What is that? Well, number one, um, Zephaniah is going to tell us what 2911 says. Fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Whoa, there's a definition of rashness. A fool vents. Do you know what vent means? Blows out. Have you ever been in a car and you turn on the air conditioning and nothing happens and then you fiddle with the buttons and all of a sudden, poof, all the air starts blowing out. You had the vent closed. Venting means you open up and let it out. A lot of people vent their feelings. They vent their emotions. God says, Zephaniah just read God's will, that a, a fool lets it all out. Just If you bother them, they tell you. And they say, I don't like you. I've never liked you. Did you know all of us have bad feelings and thoughts? But a wise person, Zephaniah just read, holds them in thinks about him and says, you know what? That doesn't please God. That's not going to help, you know, the person I say it to. It's not going to... How can you share the gospel with someone if you tell them off? If you are mean to them? If you say horrible things? Could you ever share the gospel with them? Probably not. So the Bible says, even if someone offends you, you hold it in. And that's, that's what self-control is. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you have never have bad feelings or bad thoughts. But it means you say, oh Lord, help me not to ruin my testimony by like that. Okay, next, um, Ellen's gonna read verse 27 of 17. Whoever always tries these will pass knowledge, and he who has the close spirit is a man of understanding. Oh, you see this calm spirit shows you understand that God's in control. Okay, next, uh, Rawl is going to read 29.8. Go first set a city of flame, but the wise turn away rest. And verse uh, 11, Sophia, 29.11. It's the same that Seth did. Mm -hmm. So, if we'll give full of to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. And by the way, th th do you know Proverbs is filled with repetition? And, and it's also called parallelism, where it says the same thing two different ways. That's the structure of Proverbs. Do you remember Proverbs was primarily given orally? That means spoken. And they passed it on by saying these things and paralleling. But basically, the whole book of Proverbs says over and over again, God wants his control, calm spirit, slow to anger. Uh, next, God says that Wise people seek these actions. So I need 19.2, which, uh, boy, I have gonna, it'd be much faster if I just learned your name. Noah is gonna read 19.2. And Michael, we need you to do 13.16. And then 12.23 um, for uh, Sam. So Noah, 19.2. So hasty, do you know what hasty means? To be in a hurry. A hasty person, they're like this. A hasty person will start talking before you finish what you're saying. Like if you're asking a question, they'll start answering it before they hear it. They're hasty, they can't wait. Um, 
people are hasty. Uh, Bonnie and I travel a lot, and you know, you push the button, wait for the elevator door to open. If you don't immediately push in, the people behind you go right around you, and put, they're hasty. They're in a hurry. Another word is impatient. Another word is pushy. They just And God says, wise people are cautious, not hasty. And uh, in America, at a, at a hotel that's being constructed, the elevator doors opened and there was no elevator there and the people fell in the hole. They just were so fast, they didn't even think there was no elevator there. And thankfully, they, it wasn't very far down. But that's just, that's what this means. You look before you leap. You look before you jump in. You look before you, actually you listen before you say anything. The Bible says that's wisdom. Uh, next thing, 1316, um, Michael. And everything the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool's wants is folly. The prudent acts with knowledge. So you kind of, you kind of, Gather information before you act. That's what it means, thinking before you act. Okay, now thinking before you speak, Sam. 12, 23. So have you ever met someone that tells you everything they know before they even know the situation? See, think before you say something. You might say something that hurts the person. You might say something that embarrasses the person. See, th this is what godly wisdom looks like. Okay, I want to get to uh, how does this impact marriage? Well, see, the whole book of Proverbs says the way you have the best marriage is by you being the wisest person possible in life. It's not finding the prettiest person. It's not finding the richest person. It's not finding the most popular person. It's finding the wisest person. That's who you should marry. The wisest person. Remember what, what wisdom is? Does anybody remember from the quiz what wisdom is? What is wisdom? Yeah, God's way. What is God's way? It's written down. 99% of all the decisions you can make in life are already written down by God. And what you do is, you, you desire to know God's way. That's what a wise person is. You want to know what God's way is, and then when you go through life and you come to a point where you can go one of two ways, you examine the direction of this choice. So this is choice one, and this is choice two, and you look at where they're headed, the ultimate, and you say, wait a minute, God says that direction in life does not please him. So then you look at this one and you go, ah, this one does. For example, in America, many people get job offers from companies. And they live, uh, you know, if America is this big, they live, you know, right here. And they get a job offer right here and they get a job offer right here. And what they primarily decide on is how much the job pays. Whether they're gonna move their family here or move their family there. But God says money is not the only way we make decisions. What else matters? Well, here they have a good church, they have good support, they're accountable. They have a group of people around them that know them and love them. He, let's say if they go here, there's no church. There are no people that they know. And if they go here, oh, they're near, you know, there's a good church that teaches the Bible and good support, people around them. But this one is less money. This one is more money. So let me give you a little test. If you were getting two job offers, and one of them was for a lot of money, but you were going to a place where there's no church and nobody knows you, and another one where there's a good church and people know you, but it's less money, which one does the Bible say is the wiser choice? Guess. Yeah, because, do you remember yesterday? 
The Bible says only a fool wants to be separate from people and not have anybody know what's going on in their life because they're proud and they want their own way. A wise person wants to be around a group of people in church that says, Rawl, are you discipling your wife? Um, 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 Noah, are, are you, you know, spending time with your children? Sam, are you memorizing verses? See, that's what should happen when you go into church. They should be saying, when's the last time, Ellen, you shared the gospel with someone? And you go, I haven't for a whole week. And they go, well, I'm praying for you that you will. See, that's what a good church does. You go here and you'll stop going to church and you'll start feeling cold and distant and far from the Lord. So marriage is all about you being the wisest person, okay? So our goal is to have lives and marriages that are useful to God. The goal is not to have this happy, kind of endless vacation type of marriage. You know, like the best house, the best clothes, the best everything. Marriage is to have a, uh, or usefulness is to have a life and marriage that God can use for his glory because life is so short. So let's, let's look at what that looks like in the book of Proverbs. Uh, now this is where it gets really embarrassing. Proverbs is very descriptive of marriage. And so I'll, I'll read Proverbs 5, 18. So you guys, look at what God says about marriage. 5, 18. <laughs> Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be. And the end of verse 19 is an amazing verse. Intoxicated. Do you know what God says marriage is like? Marriage is like living in a river of intoxicating blessings. Is that what most people, is that what most marriages look like? I'm a pastor. For 40 years, I watched people just like you sitting in church. And they would sit on the main floor and in the balcony. And I'd watch them come in, and most of them were like this. They, most of them were married, most of them had families. They would walk in, and the husband or wife would walk across the pew, and then child, 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 and then the husband or wife would be at the end. And they would be that far apart. That's okay if you have bad kids, but you know what's wiser? To put one on each side and one in the middle, and you be closer, so at least you can have your hand on the back of the pew and uh, you know, say to your wife, hey honey, Thanks for all the work you do, and the kids look great. You dressed them well this morning, and it's just wonderful to sit in church. But most of them, most couples look like they're not even friends when you see them come into church. They don't come in close together. Have you ever seen a couple? Do they date in Korea, or is dating not? I mean, what do you, they do date here. Do they date in Brazil, or, or <laughs> where are you from? Um, Bahamas. Do they date in the Bahamas? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do people date in Vietnam? <laughs> Guys like girls and chase them around in Vietnam? Okay. Uh, Mariana, do they date in Brazil? Okay. Cody, do you see any dating in Finley? <laughs> yep, okay. Zoe, Taiwan, do they date? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, let me ask this. Are boys interested in girls in Taiwan? <laughs> Are girls interested in boys in Taiwan? No, you know what I mean? Let, let me show you something from America. This is how you can always tell what's going on. If you are driving down the road, this is a, a pickup truck and this is the back window and you see a boy <coughs> sitting here and you see this is, you know, you're driving behind them. You know, here's the license plate. It says Ford. And, you know, here's the, uh, the windows, I mean, the rear view mirrors. If you see a boy sitting there and you see a girl, I mean, she is sitting almost behind the steering wheel, too. So he's driving and she's right there. And he's got his arm. Here, 
He's got his arm around her. What do you think they're doing? They're dating. That means they're not married. That means that this guy washed his truck, drove it over, opened the door, knocked, brought the girl out, took her, put her in the car, and he's taken her somewhere to eat or a movie. Now, if you see, so they're like this, driver, boy, passenger, girl. But if you get behind a truck and you see a man here and a woman way over here, right there, do you know what they are? Married. <laughs> no. No, that is exactly what everybody knows. That's why no one wants to get married, because it ruins everything in their minds. Because they don't see married people acting like that. But Proverbs 5.18 says, that's how God designed marriage. God designed marriage to be like that. To be a river, to be intoxicating endlessly. Okay, second one, uh, Proverbs 18.22, uh, that is Naomi is gonna read that in a minute. And then Cody, you're gonna to get to read uh, Malachi 2, 14 and 15, okay? So Naomi's gonna to get to Proverbs 18, 22. And by the way, uh, we're gonna slip back to uh, Monica. In a minute, you're gonna get to Genesis 29, 20. And Mariana, you're gonna get Psalm 128, 3 in just a minute. Okay, so Naomi. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and will take favor from God. Whoa, God says getting married is finding favor from God. If you find a wife that is like God describes her, it's really a blessing. Okay, uh, let's, Cody, let's hear Malachi 2, 14 and 15. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in the union? And what was the one God seeking? Now this is in the context of divorce. Malachi, you know, is about divorce. But what God is saying is, you shouldn't get divorced because she is the wife of your youth, your companion. See, what God planned is that when you're young, you, you merge your life with someone. And the older you get, the closer you get. The, the more wonderful marriage is. Did you know marriage, actually, I've been married 35, 36 years in December. So I've been married 35, and three-fourths or something like that. And when I look back, I can't believe Bonnie married me because, you know, remember all the bad things I used to do and so selfish and so impatient and everything else. Marriage, well, I do have to say one thing. I went to a Christian school. They had 7,200 students. That's how many. I went to a big Christian college that many students. This many of them were girls. I dated this many. I dated <coughs> 700 different <coughs> girls. Bonnie, number 742. You know what? <laughs> I didn't want to date any of them twice. That's how much trouble. See, my parents didn't get along. My mom and dad met at a bar drinking. How do you, that's a great place to find your wife. Go get drunk and sit by someone and marry them. They worked together, they met at the bar, they got married. My parents never got along, ever, that I remember. And I only lived with them for about 27 years. I didn't ever see them like that, ever. My mother used to throw plates at my dad. That's not a good thing, women. 
my father in America was called a golden gloves boxer. That's what he fought in, in the ring. He was a boxer. You guys ever watch boxing matches? He was good. He won money. That's what golden gloves is. You win money for fighting. When my mother would throw a plate at him or something, my dad would look this way and go, Phew. and he would, my mother would fall onto the ground. He actually knocked her out. That's how I grew up. My father hitting my mother. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to hit anybody. And I didn't want plates thrown at me. So my only idea of marriage was my mother throwing plates and my father punching. When I was bad, was I bad very often? Do you know how my father corrected me? He would go like this. Remember, he was a boxer. His hands were about this. Each hand was about that big. They were like almost twice as big as my hands. He had big hands, because I think because he fought so much. He would come up with his hands, and he would grab me around the neck and push me against the wall and lift me up till my little legs were off the floor. And he would keep going. And my face would turn first this color, and then it would turn uh, bright red, like your shirt there. And he would say, if you ever do that again, I'll break your neck. And he would drop me to the floor. So you know what, I didn't want to get married and I didn't want to have kids, because I didn't want to choke anybody. I didn't want to punch people. So I dated a lot of girls once. But the whole time I prayed that I would have a biblical marriage partner that would be every, because I was reading the Bible. And the Bible said she's like intoxicating river. She's goodness and favor. She's your companion for life. It's supposed to be such a wonderful attraction. Do you remember that when Jacob waited for his wife, it's like it just went by so fast. It was so wonderful. And, and she's a delightful, fruitful vine. And so I prayed every day. I would say there's nothing I prayed for more than that the Lord would not let me marry the wrong person, but guide me to the right person. So on May 2nd, 1983, I knocked on the door of a house in South Carolina, and the door opened that far. And I saw, the only thing I saw was Bonnie's eyes and her smile. She just kind of went around the door like that and I could see her like that. Instantly, inside I went, that's who I prayed for my whole life. This, this, is, this is the one that, this is the one I've always prayed for. And I didn't tell her that until our second date. I said to her, you're the one that I have prayed for since I was a little boy. Because my parents were, had so much trouble, I didn't want to be like them. So I said, God, show me a biblical marriage partner. Okay, so Genesis 29, 20 is uh, Monica. Wow. That's what marriage is like. Marriage is such a wonderful attraction that seven years of hard labor waiting for this moment is just like he said a few days. Okay, uh, Psalm 128.3, Mariana. Those are beautiful pictures from the Bible about what God wants. Well, how do you have a marriage like that? Be and become and wait and find. A, you you want to be and become a person who believes that marriage was designed by God and you want to follow his plan. That's what Genesis says. Be and become a person who will, I mean, look and find someone that will correspond to you. So see, you, you want to be and become what God says, and you want to wait and find that person who corresponds to you. Now, the Bible describes marriage as a person that corresponds to you. Now, some of you may have seen, um, they, they make this piece of jewelry, 
And what it is is it's a, uh, it's a circle and then the circle is cut like this. So it goes into two pieces. But when you have both pieces, they fit together. And that, that is actually the Hebrew word for marriage is in Genesis 2, 18, is someone, so this is the husband and this is the wife. And where the husband is weak, the wife is strong. Where the husband is strong, the wife is weak. Where the husband is weak. And see how their, their strengths and weaknesses exactly merge. Because God designs a person who will correspond to you. How do you know who they are? You don't spend your life uh, you know, worrying about it. You be and become the person God wants you to be. You know the best thing to do to have a wonderful marriage? Be the wisest biblical person possible on earth to be. And then wait and ask God to show you someone who corresponds to you. Now, don't, don't waste the time. I mean, I didn't. In, in uh, seven years, I dated on an average of 100 different girls each year. I, I have my journal that I kept, their name and everything I learned about them. I asked them their testimony and everything. Never ask them out again. But I got to know girls very well. I learned all the different ways they acted and everything. So I was, I, but during that time I was becoming who God wanted me to be. Uh, be a person, uh, become a person who will be glued. Um, you know what the Bible says in Genesis 2, 24? That Marriage is that you're so glued to each other. Um, I'll just give you some advice, young ladies. Watch out for boys who can't keep their eyes off every girl that walks by. In fact, I, I used to go out to lunch with, with all my buddies in college, and we'd go and sit you know, at a cafe on the street, and I would watch their eyes, and a girl would be walking by, and their eyes would go, they're, they're looking them up and down. Uh, they used to call it raking them. They'd go. <laughs> and we'd be talking, and the next girl would walk by. And you could just see their head. They'd go. And they'd be talking, but, and then they'd get back and smile at you. Then another girl would walk by. Did you know that is not a good habit? Did you know if you're married to a guy, and you're out to eat, and every person, that, every girl that walks by, they're going, and looking them over. It would, after a while, make you feel like, how come he doesn't look at me? The Bible says it's a choice to be glued to one person. Jesus put it this way, if your eye be single, you have to learn to have your eyes focus on one person. It's very hard in the age you guys live. Most kids from about age nine on in the Western world are seeing pornographic images. It's on 9, 10, and 11. Did you know kids are getting sexually active at 11 and 12? It's unbelievable. It's never been like this in the history of the world, what's happening. By the time you get to high school, kids have done everything. They've seen everything. There's no mystery. Now, you might be different, but I'm talking about Western culture People that in their home have computers, cable television, VCRs, and smartphones. Kids find a way to see stuff. You can put every blockade on you want, and they find a way around it. You know, they go to Wikipedia that has links, and they go this way and that way. They just learn how to find what they're looking for. Did you know that ruins the glue of marriage? Because if, if you Learn by habit to be unsatisfied and looking at every guy or every girl that goes by and longing after them. How will you ever learn to limit that to one? You understand? So what you're supposed to do now is to be and become a wise person. And a wise person shuns evil. That, that's, you know, that's another reason I have verses on here. I can waste a lot of time on my phone. There's a lot of things that waste your time that don't matter forever.
Okay, uh, here's something that's interesting. Did you know that a, a person that would make a good marriage partner, God describes them as they want to be home, they want to be, did someone turn the clock ahead? No, Jew, you didn't turn the clock ahead? Okay, time for your break, see you back.